So we're starting a new chapter uh, where we're talking about plate tectonics and we're going to go into kind of a lot of detail, a lot of information in this chapter. And for some of you, you probably haven't heard any of this stuff since probably middle school. Um, the picture in the background that'll be the background on all the slides is actually something I want to draw your attention to. Just like with the currents, we had to learn all of the, or most of the currents. Um, I'm going to expect you to know the major and some of the minor plates. Um, so the picture in the background is actually the map I'm going to give you with the 14 to 16-ish major plates on it. Um, so I just wanted to see that. Before we can talk about plate tectonics, we should probably back up and make sure we're all on the same page with where the Earth came from. So the nebular hypothesis is the notion that um, everything in the solar system used to be in a giant rotating dust cloud all in one plane. And that dust cloud um, was hot, um, was full of uh, hydrogen and helium, things like that. And it was basically the sun. Um, the sun eventually shrank down. The sun was bigger. The sun uh, probably extended all the way out to the edges of Jupiter. And as it shrank down, it left behind clumps of um, dust, we keep calling it. But these were planet-sized blobs of dust. And when it shrank back down, one of the blobs it left behind was the Earth. Um, this early Earth um, eventually solidified. We call it the proto-Earth or early Earth. It was a little bigger than it is now. As it cooled, it shrank down. Um, it had no oceans or life, and it was uh, homogeneous, which means basically it was the same material throughout. It was um, as if you'd taken just a blob of dirt, rolled it around, and stuck it back together. It did not stay this way. Over time, um, it underwent density stratification. And what this means is that the heavier, denser materials move towards the middle of the Earth, um, and the layers... Um, that were lighter moved to the top. And this is kind of gave rise to this image we have over here called the candy corn model. Um, I don't know if it's officially called that, but every teacher I've had ever called it that. It looks like a piece of candy corn. And um, you should know this, this has two major things going on here. Um, we have the, the earth classified by chemical composition, which is basically split into three. Um, we have the core, the mantle, and the crust. And then um, if we do it by um, physical properties, we have more layers. We have the inner core, um, which is uh, solid, outer core, um, liquid, see, physical states. The mesosphere, which is um, rock and very thick. The asthenosphere, which is plastic. Lithosphere, which is also um, like rock-like and basically the crust. So what you will see these um, terms used almost interchangeably in the book just know that they come from different ways of classifying the Earth's layers, whether we're talking about chemical composition or physical composition, and that together we basically came up, um, they show how the Earth is basically in different layers. So plate tectonics um, is going to explain a lot of stuff. We're going to talk, eventually you'll be able to go through this. I'm going to go through this pretty quick since we go through all of it again later on. Um, why the mountains are what they are, where they are, why we have volcanoes and earthquakes and um, fault lines and how that explains local areas as well as um, sort of global patterns. The formation of the ocean floor itself, which is going to be really important later on. Um, the origin of these landforms and oceanic features, things like um, chains of mountains or mid-ocean ridges. And also how that um, interacts with other things such as um, life forms and what type of animals we have and where they're found. Additionally, um, things you should know, lithosphere and asthenosphere, um, these are two terms we're going to use interchangeably, and I, you should know what they mean. The lithosphere are the actual plates. They're made up of um, crust material themselves. The asthenosphere is the somewhat liquid area in which they float. Um, we're going to talk about the three different types of plate boundaries, and you're going to learn all 15 or so plates. Um, there's some random factoids you sort of need to know we'll talk about in greater detail. But the plates move, and, and they are still moving, and they move it um, on an average of one to five inches a year. Um, some of them move very, very fast. Some of them move very, very slow. The India plate is crashing into the Eurasian plate all the time at about seven and a half inches a year, which is um, kind of fast. And that the plates started moving, this is three billion years ago. Um, they've extended to that maybe three and a half, three point eight billion years ago. And it will stop at some point. Um, even though the Earth is separating the layers, the inner core is hot radioactive. And that's the heat that drives um, this engine that is plate tectonics. 
and eventually that heat will run out and um, those reactions will stop and the, the continents will be fixed in whatever spot they're in. And then we're going to talk about the seafloor and how much more quickly it moves than plates, which may seem like a weird idea. You probably think they move all the same speed right now, but they don't. There's a man. His name is Alfred Wegener. Um, you have to know his name. He came up with the idea of continental drift. He's considered the father of uh, plate tectonics or even um, physical oceanography. And he, clearly by his name, he's a German guy. He called himself a geophysicist, which may, basically means he was interested in the Earth and physics. And he was the first person to come up with the idea that the continents moved around in 1915. We don't call it continental drift anymore. Somewhat, they, continental drift and plate tectonics are somewhat interchangeable. But for the purposes of this chapter, you're going to have to be able to use them and differentiate between them. So let's talk about continental drift, specifically just Wegener's idea, because plate tectonics takes into account his ideas, drops the parts where he was wrong, and yes, he was wrong in parts, and adds in more modern science, uh, like the stuff by Bullard. One of the things Wegener noticed um, immediately, and, and you probably did this exercise when you are uh, when you were in middle school or elementary school, that if you look at the, the maps of the continents, they sort of fit together, especially, um, I don't know if you can see in the back there, um, people have been noticing for as long as they've been making maps, basically, that this edge of, um, see it underneath there, South America looks like it would fit super nicely in there. Um, and Sir Francis Bacon um, even mentioned this back in 1620, that there's just appears to be some pieces that go together. And Wegener actually tried to put these pieces together, and he called that one large landmass, Pangaea, another word you need to know, and that Panthalassia was the large sea that surrounded Pangaea, um, the remnants of which are uh, is the Pacific Ocean. And he took these from Greek. And the Tethys Sea was actually where Pangaea began to split. And when it split, um, the Mediterranean popped out. Um, and then it also split along another axis and we got the Atlantic Ocean. Wagner used the actual edges of the continents. We now know that it's a little bit better to, um, there was a guy named Bullard in the 60s. He actually did computer modeling. And he found out that the best fit is at uh, 200 meters below the sea level, which is basically halfway between modern sea level and uh, deep ocean basin or the continental shelf. Um, and this is a picture of Pangaea um, as uh, Wegener imagined it. Um, and you can see Pangaea in here. It's remnants of what will become the Mediterranean. Um, and that's the Tethys Sea. That's another one you should probably know. Wegener also used matching rocks and um, mountains. So if you look at um, the Appalachian Mountains, which are right along uh, the East Coast or a little inland, and the Caledonian Mountains in Europe, they actually are very similar in height, size, age, and rock composition. He also um, noticed that the rocks in South America um, match better with Africa than North America, that they're more similar in composition. And one of the big pieces that he kind of harped on a lot is that there... So when you met, when you take gold out, gold is usually mixed with things, and it, it has a purity level. And that purity level um, is tends to be local. It's more pure in some areas than others. What was interesting to Wegener and, and people since then is that the gold in South America is actually... Um, has the exact same level of purity and occurs at the exact same depths as it does in Africa. This suggests that they used to be one continent. Uh, here's a picture in the book. It's in Chapter 2. Um, and you can see where the Caledonian Mountains match up with the Appalachian Mountains right in here. Um, these are our Appalachian Mountains here. And they run right into the um, mountains in Europe. Um, the same thing happens across North America into South America. Um, so you see some of these mountain changes that, that match. Um, Wegener also talked about... Um, he found that there was examples of glacial activity in tropical areas. And um, the exact evidence he saw was that when glaciers move, they dig big gouges in um, rock uh, because they're so heavy and, and whatnot. And there's really nothing else, no other mechanism for this. So he knew that there were these gouges in rock in places like Africa that we now know of as tropical. Um, and the, and the, there are two implications for this. Either we had... Um, Africa didn't used to be where it is now, or we had a worldwide ice age. 
and and we're fairly certain there was never a worldwide ice age. There's other issues, um, such as uh, with different levels of water and and the age of the sun. That there was probably never a complete worldwide ice age. Also, Spitsberg is in Germany. There are evidence of fossil palm trees in there. Um, there's coal actually in Antarctica. Antarctica is covered by ice. Coal comes from the fossilization of plants. If Antarctica has always been where Antarctica is now. It would not have been possible for plants to grow there and thus have coal. Um, so there's a lot of a examples of climactic and glacial evidence uh, related to climate, um, excuse me, continental drift. Uh, here's an, the picture from the book that talks about the glacial grooves. You can see in Africa they show, not only do the grooves um, show you uh, that there used to be ice there, but also tells you which way it moved. This is because Africa and Antarctica used to be connected in a much more southerly area. So the Mesosaur is something you need to know. The Mesosaur was a uh, aquatic reptile that lived in shallow coastal areas. You can sort of imagine it as an ancient crocodile. It did not have the ability to swim all the way across oceans. The Mesosaur was found in two places. It was found on the west coast of South America and the east coast of Africa. There's a picture in the book. The Mesosaur could not have been found there unless South America and Africa were much closer together. Uh, they had to have been what we would call a coastal inland sea, which is an area that's very shallow, and they lived around the edges of it, sort of the way um, saltwater crocodiles live around the edges of Australia now. It was not possible for the species to swim back and forth across the Atlantic. This also suggests that the plates were closer together. Additionally, we have relatively recently evolved mammals like marsupials, which are found in North and South America, um, Despite the fact that there are none found in Europe, this also suggests Australia was closer to those two than it currently is. Here's the picture of the Mesosaur, and you can see um, full fossils found on each side, and their age suggests they were closer together. We're actually going to stop there. I uh, will talk about the objections to this model tomorrow, and uh, yeah.